Thessalonians chapter number 4, look with me at verse number 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Thank you again for coming this morning. You know, there are many folks who have been saved in different churches over the last 50 years who are no longer in those churches for various reasons. Most of the reasons that they're not in church anymore would not hold water when they stand before God as an excuse as to why they've given up their church family or their church attendance. But sadly, many Christians have simply become lukewarm in their faith and their spiritual lives. You know, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, I've, I've re referenced this a couple of times in the last few weeks. It contains God's letters uh, spoken by Jesus Christ to the seven churches. And these seven churches all have some characteristic uh, that we find in today's Bible-believing churches and all but one received some sort of a rebuke from Christ. There was something that the church was doing that Christ was not pleased with. The one that didn't receive rebuke was the church at a place called Smyrna. And uh, these folks were known for their willingness to be martyred. Polycarp, their pastor, was burned at the stake for his faith in Christ. Sometime when you get an opportunity, read his testimony. It will encourage you. The last church spoken to, however, was the Laodicean church, and Christ rebuked them for not taking a decisive stand on the things that are important to God. They were lukewarm in their approach to the things of God, Christ said. And instead, they wanted to go with the flow. Let's not bully people with the Bible. Let's not call out sin. Let's just all try and get along with each other. Listen, church, listen, there's no point no point at this point in time in the church history to give up the faith. There's no point in that. Uh, the, the, the faith that was once delivered to the early church by the very apostles of Christ, no point in surrendering any ground to the world or to the devil. We don't need to surrender anything to the world. Our mission is to convert the world to Jesus Christ. We don't want the world converting the church. Amen. The people who have left church haven't stopped believing what they once believed. They're still saved if they were truly saved to start with. The problem is this. Too many Christians have stopped being excited about what they once believed. Nothing seems to stir them up anymore for the cause of Christ. Uh, we can have revivals at church. We can have special meetings, but yet... Many times God's people just go home and go about their merry way, never even stopping and considering any of the things that were said. They would still give a testimony that is still somewhere deep down in their heart. They can even recall when they first believed it. But the problem is it is now it has no controlling influence in their life that they're living. They just kind of live like the world lives and they claim salvation and they probably are saved in most cases. But... They just don't have a desire and an excitement anymore for the things of God. Many churches are going through the motions. They've lost their excitement. So today I want to give you something that I believe will excite you. Amen. It should excite you because it's part of God's inspired holy word. And we find it in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 beginning in verse number 13 we just read a minute ago. You know, we find here the doctrine of the rapture explained. You know, the word rapture is found nowhere in our Bible. 
But the translation of the original words are uh, translated and the principle of the rapture is clearly explained here in this passage of scripture. The rapture is a Bible fact. It is a Bible doctrine. But you know what? Many don't believe it. Many Bible believers don't believe it. I'm not sure how they come to that conclusion. But several years ago, the story is told of a preacher about the first time he heard the preaching on the rapture at a revival meeting at his church. This was before God called him to preach. He was newly saved, didn't know much about the Bible, but one night, they had a revival service at his church, and the preacher there preached on the rapture. And the first time that this young saved person had ever heard the message of the rapture was that very first time in the church. And after the service was over with, he was so excited about what he had heard, he went up and he caught his pastor before he left, and he kind of got him cornered a little bit, and he said, Pastor, Pastor, he said, is what that man tonight said, is, is it true what he said that one day we're going to fly away off of this earth and we're going to meet the Lord Jesus in the air just like he explained it to us? And his pastor kind of looked at him kind of funny and he said, yeah, 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 that's in the Bible. And that young saved man thought to himself for a second, he said, it's in the Bible but the young man thought to, his past, thought to himself about his pastor. He said, why is my pastor not more excited about that? It excites me, he thought. He knew enough to know that since he, was, uh, since he had been born again, he was now part of the church, and one day he was going to lift off of this earth just like a NASA rocket, amen. He did not know a lot of Bible doctrines, but that night, God drove the doctrine of the rapture deep into his heart, and he held on to it from that point forward. He was so excited that on his way home, lived in a small town, small church, and as he was on his way home, he stopped at the only stoplight in town, and uh, while he was sitting there at the stoplight, he couldn't help himself, so he rolled his window down. That was back when you used to have to roll your window down, okay? And he stuck his head out the window, and he started looking up at the sky. And then he'd pull himself back in, and then he'd go out and he'd look. And about that moment, he noticed the car that had stopped at the light right next to him was another man from the church, older fella. And so he was looking out the window at the sky, and he looked at the other fella, and he caught his attention, and he went. And the other fella just kind of put his hand up and... Away they went. The next night at the church, he found that same older fellow and he said, did you see what I was doing last night? He said, I was looking up at the sky and pointing up. That's where we're going to meet the Lord Jesus. And the old man said to him, yeah, yeah, I know, but you don't have to be looking for it. Again, kind of had no real excitement about it. And he said to the older fellow, he said, well, you know what? He said, I wasn't pointing at it because, you know, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Or I wasn't pointing at it because I had to. I was pointing because I want to. Amen. He said, that excites me to know that one day Jesus Christ himself is going to come and we're going to fly off this earth and, and have have, our, have our, uh, our meeting with the Lord, and, and, and Jesus Christ could come at any moment. That's what the preacher said last week. The old man said to the young person, yeah, but you don't have to be looking for it. To that, the young man just kind of went away, kind of discouraged that this older fellow wasn't more excited to meet Jesus. Many years Ago, a fundamental, most fundamental people in fundamental churches, when they would leave after the services were over with, they never said goodbye. Instead, they said, see you next week if the Lord doesn't come. Or they might say something like, well, we'll see you there, uh, here, there, or in the air, amen. 
But you know, those kind of those 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 uh, traditions have seemingly sort of fallen away from the church, and there doesn't seem to be the excitement for Christ to come for his bride any longer. Those saints of old were were certain that the rapture was going to happen any day very soon, and and they were anticipating uh, Christ's return. But somewhere along the way in this last several years of history, the church has lost some of its excitement for that. The the vision of the upper taker has been lost to other things. And something happened to the church, and it is taking place even to this day. Uh, The church is now more concerned about world events than they are about Christ coming for them. They're more concerned about politics than they are the rapture. Uh, They're more concerned about politics than seeing their family saved, as if politics was going to save anyone. There's no politician that's going to save anyone. On their best day, even if they're conservative, amen. And even if they're saved. The blessed hope for this church and all churches like this church is Jesus Christ's imminent return. To take his church out of here. That is what we should be most concerned about and be looking for. Telling others about. Amen. Not all these other things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now you think about this in the context of what Paul was writing here to the Thessalonians. And at that time in history, that was a long time ago. But I want you to understand here, Paul started that statement by saying, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know, there's a lot of people in this world. uh, There's a lot of people in churches in this world. A lot of people in Bible-believing churches in this world who are ignorant of what we're talking about this morning. They don't even have an understanding of the rapture. Matter of fact, if you ask them, give me a description of what the rapture means to you, they would be lost to tell you anything about it. In other words, there's an ignorant. And Paul said here, I would not have you to be ignorant. God does not want us to be ignorant of the doctrines of this Bible, especially something as important as the rapture of the church. He goes on, he says, concerning them which are asleep. There's a lot of believers that we know that have gone on before us and they're already, they've already passed away. And, and, and Paul was saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about those folks that, have been lo- that, that you've lost in death, that you sorrow not. Even why? Because Paul was getting ready to tell them, hey, they've got a reunion coming, amen. And we're going to be part of that reunion and we're going to see them again. That ought to get us excited. Those of you who have lost loved ones who you desperately and dearly loved uh, that were saved and were under the blood of Christ, you're going to see them again. Amen. That should give us great hope. Excitement. There's a lot of brethren who fit into this category, by the way, of being ignorant. They know Jesus as their Savior, but they don't want to know much else about the future or what the future holds for them as a believer. Now listen, I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings this morning, but inevitably when you teach and preach certain parts of Scripture, you can't help but offend some people. Many believers are not living like the rapture could come at any moment. They've forgotten or are not even concerned. It's because they never have studied, they never have learned, they've never been taught. Why? Because they're ignorant about what the Bible says, but they're willingly ignorant because they never take time to study the things of God and understand what be, uh, what's coming for them in the future. Instead, they have believed their emotions and their feelings. And I'm telling you, your emotions and your feelings will lie to you every time. You know why much of the world has no hope beyond the grave? Because all of their gods went into the grave and had nothing more to say. Muhammad died and had nothing more to say. Many died and had nothing more to say. Confucius died and had nothing more to say. Buddha died, had nothing more to say. Consequently, many who believe in those gods are walking around today and in real true honesty have no hope. 
because their God is dead. Jesus went into the grave and three days later, He came walking out alive and said, I win! He won the victory over death. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. But I want you to notice the first couple of words. For if we believe. You say, well, of course we believe, Pastor. You know, we say it, but we, do we really mean it? For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. Notice it doesn't say, if we're saved. It doesn't say, if we join the church. It doesn't say, if we never smoke, never drink. If we sing in the choir. What does it say? It says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. It is, a, it is great to be a good person and do all those things I just mentioned. But good people die and go to hell. I want you to live a clean life as your pastor, but people who live a clean life still die and go to hell. You must be born again, amen? amen. And that requires that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not believe about Him. But you believe on Him, which means what? It means you understand of what He's done for you. You realize that you were a sinner, couldn't save yourself, and Jesus died on the cross and took your place, and He put His blood over your sins. And from that point forward, you are a child of God, and you're never to leave the family of God. And one day, you're going up. Amen. And that ought to excite you. The only way to take... Uh, the only way to be taken in the rapture is if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, paid your sin debt with His own blood. That's the only way you're going. Jesus died, rose again. This is what gives us hope. We call it the blessed hope. Jesus Christ left His grave clothes in that tomb, walked out alive, said, I win because He was never going back ever again. But all those gods that the world still worships are still in their tombs, rotting and decaying, because they were nothing but men. Just as sure as Jesus went into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father, will God take everyone else into heaven who believes on Jesus? That's what verse 14 is saying. You know why God the Father let Jesus Christ back into heaven? Because of His righteousness, because of His holiness. You know what you got the moment you got saved? You got the righteousness of Christ and His holiness applied to your account. You're not going to heaven because you're a great person. You're going because Jesus Christ imputed His righteousness to your account when you believed on His finished work on the cross of Calvary. Somebody's loved one dies, and as Christians we often ask the question, well, were they saved? You know what you always hear? Well, I hope so. I hope so. We don't have to hope so. We know so if we believe on Christ. Your loved one is going up in the rapture if they believed on Jesus Christ too. You can count on it. If God let Jesus into heaven because of His righteousness, you can count on your loved ones being there also because the righteousness of Jesus gets imputed to their account the moment they believe on Christ. Look at verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now in this verse, there are those in modern Christianity who want to argue over this one word in this text, and it's the word prevent. Most of the modern Bible versions that you buy at the bookstore will have the word proceed in their text instead of prevent. But you know what I see? Upon closer inspection of this word, prevent is the proper word that our translators gave us in our King James Bible. 
What we see is exactly what is said. There's not a thing that I can do or not a thing that you can do to prevent anyone who has trusted and believed on Christ from going to heaven and being in the presence of the Lord upon the rapture or their death. Not a thing. So therefore, the word prevent is the proper word to put there. But you know what the modern Bible translators will tell you? They'll say this. Well, the reason that I don't want to use that King James Bible anymore is because all the words in there are archaic. There's archaic words in there. Nobody understands them. But see, right out of the blocks, their, their theory is flawed because the word archaic means that the word is no longer in use anywhere. You see how silly that is? Last time I checked, the word prevent is still being used pretty regularly. So don't tell me that the word prevent is an archaic word that should not be in the Bible anymore. Uh, it's, it's there because God, under the inspiration of the Spirit, uh, worked with our translators and, and their godly men that translated our Bibles, and they put in there the word that the, the Lord, I believe, led them to put. They were men that were godly men. But the problem is archaic is no longer, means words that are no longer in use. And last time I checked, there's no words in our Bible that are archaic. They're still being used by those of us who believe this book. See, that's the problem with society. They always want something new. The new and improved version. If the word was supposed to be translated proceed... There would be no reason for the Bible to include verse number 16. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. If the word proceed was in there, there'd be no point in verse 16. But notice what it says. For the Lord himself shall descend. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is going to do it all. He's going to do it all. It's not dependent on you or I. We, he doesn't need our help. He's going to do it all. You know what verse 16 is saying? The creator of the universe is going to leave heaven and come and meet you and I personally, face to face, when the rapture occurs. He's not sending his, uh, his uh, emissary. You know, if you tried to go to the White House today, can't imagine anybody would want to do that, but if you did, and you said, I want to meet Joe Biden, you know what the people would say? Who are you? You say, well, I'm David Robinson. I want to speak to Mr. Biden. And they would say, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Biden's not available. And he won't be available anytime soon, so go home. If you heard that, the, that the, uh, the world famous New York giant was in town and he was going to give a talk on things, all the cowboy fans would line up to meet him, of course. But you could go to that place where he was and you'd say, hey, I want to speak to you personally and privately after this is over. He'd say, I don't even know you. I don't need to talk with you. He wouldn't give you the time of day. But here in our text, what do we see? Jesus Christ himself. The creator of everything that is. The creator of heaven and the universe and all the earth and everything in the earth. Everything that we look around and see with our eyes. That person, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ. He's coming to get you and I personally. Amen. Did you all hear what I said? He's coming personally. Jesus is going to do it all. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And bless God, he's coming and finishing things. Amen. Amen. Verse 16 is saying that the creator is going to leave his seat in heaven. That is amazing. You think we've got a story to tell to people who don't know Christ? I think we do. Problem is, we're not telling it. We're not telling it enough. 
Being a child of God has so much more to do than just escaping hellfire. But that seems to be all we talk about with a person who's unsaved. We ought to be telling them about this. Just like that young preacher who heard it for the very first time and he said, gravity's not going to hold me anymore. I'm going up, amen. The rich and famous wouldn't give you the time of day, but the professional athlete whom you worship would not give you the time of day, but the maker of heaven and earth is coming to meet you personally. You know why people don't get excited about this anymore? Or they don't get excited at all, never get excited? Because they, believe, they say they believe it, but in truth, they really don't. You say, well, not me, Pastor. I believe every word of that Bible. Well, that might be true, but you might want to tell yourself about it because you're not living like it. People get excited about a lot of things, but oftentimes the things that God has written in His book don't seem to bring any excitement to His children. He hasn't left heaven, listen, for 2,000 years, but when it's time for us to meet Him in the air, He's coming personally to get you. Jesus is coming for His gal, the bride of Christ, the church. You know, Stephen was the very first martyr, according to the Bible, that gave his life for the preaching after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Now, there might have been others, but we know Stephen's testimony because we have it in the Bible. There is no way anyone who is alive today can know for certain where Stephen's bones are buried. Stephen's soul is present with the Lord, but his bones and his old fleshly body is decaying in some grave somewhere. And it's been that way for close to 2,000 years. But his bones are going to be set free from the grave and be reunited with him at the rapture of the church. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. All of your loved ones that are born again, there's going to be a reunion. And we're going to be a part of it. The Bible says that we're going to meet him in the air. His bones are going to be set free from the grave and be reunited with him in the rapture of the church. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain, here's the good part, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Who's them? It's all those that have died in Christ. Your mothers, your fathers, your grandfathers, your grandmothers, your uncles, your aunts, your children, all of those that have died in Christ, the Bible says, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air, uh, meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Gravity will lose its grip on all the graves, and we're going to fly out of here all in the blink of an eye. My preacher in Virginia used to say this. He said, if the rapture happens and I fly out of here, if my keys fall out of my pocket, you can have my car. I don't think anyone ever got that joke, but we're going to meet him for all eternity, and we're going to be with the Lord for all eternity. Amen. Verse 18, the Bible says this. You know, we look at verse 18, we think, yeah, that's just kind of the closing verse of this text, but let me just say this to you. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, the word of God is the only book the only book that can bring you eternal comfort it can give us eternal comfort I've never been given eternal comfort from anything else that I've read but this book there's a lot of books written about the Bible there's a lot of books written about the Bible that are very good but they're not the Bible we ought to be spending more time in this book than any other book. It can give us eternal comfort. Paul said here, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What does that mean? If we'll take this book and we'll share it with other people and we'll tell them about the things of God and tell them about the fact that the creator of the heaven and the universe is coming to meet you personally if you're one of his kids, 
That will give people comfort. You tell them, say, hey, listen, you don't have to worry about all these things that are going on in our society right now. You don't have to worry about uh, what's going to happen with Russia and China and all the other places. You just have to worry about one thing, whether or not you're in the family of God. Yeah. And if you're in the family of God, guess what? You win. Just like Christ, when he walked out of the tomb, he won the victory over death and the grave. And so will everyone who trusted Christ as their Savior and believed on His work for them on their behalf. Make your plans. Listen, make your plans. The rapture is certain, certain as I'm standing here today. The rapture of the church is going to occur. You mark it down. Make your plans to be a part of it. And if you're not saved this morning, get saved before it's eternally too late. Because once the rapture occurs... Like I said on Wednesday night in our study of Revelation, the dominoes begin to fall. And it's shortly, those dominoes will fall from beginning to end and you will have missed your opportunity to be a part of the things of God. Don't put it off. Tell everyone you know not to put it off. Those people that you've been witnessing to, take this book and show them, hey, listen, you know, did you know that if you're a child of God, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you've believed on His work on Calvary's cross on your, on your behalf, you're flying out of here one day. It's going to be a better trip than Delta Airlines could give you. Amen. And it's going to happen in the twink of an eye. And by the way, a twink is faster than a blink. Don't put it off. The Lord is coming soon. We don't know exactly when. But everything that this book has told us has to happen before it can happen has happened. And we're just waiting. And like that young preacher in the beginning of our lesson this morning, he was looking up. And he was pointing. He was excited. I hope you are too. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for our opportunity this morning to look at this great doctrine called the rapture. And Father, we don't have all the answers to everything, but Lord, we know that this one thing you've told us. You've told us clearly that if we know you as our Savior and we've believed on your finished work on Calvary's cross, the Bible says to us right here that we read it this morning, that you personally, Jesus Christ personally is coming for me. Father, help us never to lose sight of that great truth. And Lord, help us to be bold to tell others that they too can be part of this wonderful time that the Lord's going to come and bring us all to glory. Father, help us this morning as we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it.